Knowledge Products presents The Social Contract by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. The place was Paris. The date was the 20th of Prairio of the year 2 in the French Revolutionary Calendar or more conventionally, the 8th of June, 1794. Maximilien Robespierre, the current leader of the revolutionary government, master of the reign of terror, was inaugurating the new religion he had decreed, the cult of the supreme being. The lavish ceremony was conducted in the Tuileries Garden on a day of remarkable loveliness. Robespierre delivered one of his lengthy orations in front of most of Paris. Then, solemnly, he set fire to the statues representing atheism, folly, and vice. The figure of wisdom emerged triumphant from the flames. Next, a long procession followed Robespierre to the Champ de Mars, where the Eiffel Tower stands today. There, the immense crowd swore allegiance to the Republic. It was Robespierre's proudest moment. Less than two months later, he would fall from power and be himself guillotined. In proposing this festival, Robespierre invoked the name of a philosopher who died some fifteen years before, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a name often on his lips. Even as a student, his head was full of Rousseau. Robespierre claimed to have met Rousseau. Divine man! I saw you during your last days, and the memory remains a source of joy and pride. I contemplated your august features and saw on them the marks of the dark disappointment to which you were condemned by the injustice of mankind. I understood all the griefs of a noble mind devoted to the worship of truth. Robespierre used Rousseau to great effect when he argued in front of the various revolutionary assemblies and clubs. To many, he was Rousseau's spiritual child. Can this be so? Is it possible that one of history's most notorious state terrorists was the legitimate heir of Rousseau, the sensitive recluse, the tender lover of nature, the impassioned tribune of virtue and justice? And how valid is the further claim that Rousseau was the progenitor of the totalitarian movements of the 20th century? In this presentation, we will examine these questions. We will begin by sketching the early life of Rousseau. Then we will discuss the works which initially brought him fame, as well as the reputation of being an enemy of the advanced civilization of his time. He was a critic of vice and hypocrisy to some. To others, a hawker of dangerous primitivism. Next, we will present the argument in Rousseau's most famous and influential political work, The Social Contract. Throughout, Rousseau's personal life will shed light on his thought. Rousseau's place of birth influenced the rest of his life. He was born in Geneva on June 28, 1712. Geneva was what it had been for centuries, an independent city-state and republic. One of Rousseau's ancestors had emigrated to Geneva from France in the middle of the 16th century. A Huguenot, or French Protestant, he was escaping the persecution of Protestants in his homeland. A few years before, the great reformer, John Calvin, had established his theocratic reign in that city. The state imposed penalties for transgressing a great array of rules concerning everyday personal life. Censors of morals as well as of publications were set up. Religious dissidents were severely punished. Rousseau's mother, Suzanne Bernard, came from a rather patrician background. Her father had often found himself in trouble with Geneva's supervisors of moral behavior, and Suzanne, reputed to have brains and beauty, had her run-ins with authority on account of girlish peccadilloes. Evidently, Rousseau never realized this, since his writings never questioned the justice of the Genevan system of moral policing. Rousseau's mother died a few days after his birth. He was raised by his father Isaac, who, although ambitious, finally settled for the trade of watchmaker. While by no means a bad father, he occasionally beat the young Rousseau, or else accused him of having caused his mother's death. Rousseau seemed to feel an irrational responsibility for this. When Rousseau was ten years old, his father came into conflict with a patrician, and he fled Geneva, deserting his children. 
Rousseau went to the home of a pastor in a nearby village. Here he was happy enough, but Rousseau recalled a soul-searing episode in his later work, Confessions. He was wrongly accused of breaking the teeth of a comb that did not belong to him. Although repeatedly beaten, he refused to admit to the crime. The incident had a lasting influence on him. That first meeting with violence and injustice has remained so deeply engraved on my heart that any thought which recalls it summons back this first emotion. The feeling was only a personal one in its origins, but it has since assumed such a consistency and has become so divorced from personal interests that my blood boils at the sight or the tale of any injustice, whoever may be the sufferer and wherever it may have taken place in just the same way as if I were myself its victim. When I read of the cruelties of a fierce tyrant, of the subtle machinations of a rascally priest, I would gladly go and stab the wretch myself, even if it were to cost me my life a hundred times over. Rousseau was apprenticed to an engraver who did not treat him kindly. One Sunday, when he was sixteen, Rousseau returned late from an excursion in the country to find the gates of Geneva already closed. He decided not to go back to his master. Instead, he crossed the border to a town in the Catholic territory of the King of Sardinia. There, he soon met a cultivated and warm-hearted lady named Madame de Warren. This was the most important friendship of his life. As an old man, he recalled the meeting. Today, Palm Sunday is exactly 50 years since I first met Madame de Warren. She was 28 then, having been born with the century. I was not yet 17, and all unknown to me, the approach of manhood was making my naturally fervent heart burn with a new ardor. If it was not surprising that she should be kindly disposed toward a lively yet gentle and modest young man of quite pleasing appearance, it was even less surprising that a charming, intelligent, and graceful woman should make me feel not only gratitude, but more tender feelings which I was unable to distinguish from it. But what is more unusual is this, that this first impulse determined my whole life and led inexorably to the fate that has governed the rest of my days. Rousseau called Madame de Warren Mama, and she called him Little One. The first of his many aristocratic patrons, and the first of the ladies with whom he entered into complex emotional relationships, she became Rousseau's lover. He remained with Madame de Warren on and off for about ten years. He read, explored music, and wandered through the countryside. These aimless wanderings made him feel free. Never did I think so much, exist so much, be myself, as in the journeys that I have made alone and on foot. Walking has something about it which animates and enlivens my ideas. I can hardly think while I am still. My body must be in motion to move my mind. The sight of the country, the succession of agreeable views, open air, good appetite, the freedom of the alehouse, the absence of everything that could make me feel dependence or recall me to my situation, all this sets my soul free, gives me a greater boldness of thought. I dispose of nature as its sovereign lord. Rousseau is often considered the forerunner of the cultural movement known as Romanticism. There are several reasons for this. His frequent glorification of emotion and impulse, and his attacks on social conventions. One of the main reasons, however, is his profound love of nature. Not of nature in every form. For instance, he could not stand the sea. But he loved to commune with hills, forests, and lakes. He wrote of them as no one before him had. All this while, Rousseau was learning from his travels and experiences more than from books. In his book, Confessions, he tells of a lesson in politics and economics learned while walking in the French countryside. He stopped at a peasant's cottage, where he implored the owner for food and drink. At first, the peasant offered Rousseau only coarse barley bread and skimmed milk. After watching the famished youth bolt down the food, however, he suddenly said that he was persuaded that Rousseau was honest and not a paid spy. 
opening a trap door by the kitchen, the peasant went into the cellar and brought back some wheat bread, a ham, and wine, which he gave to Rousseau, even adding a nice omelet. Rousseau explained the peasant's fear. At the last, he tremblingly pronounced the terrible words, Excise man! He hid his wine on account of the excise, and his bread on account of the duty, and he would be a lost man if they suspected for a moment that he was not dying of hunger. All that he said to me on this subject, which was entirely strange to me, made an impression on me which will never grow dim. It was the germ of that inextinguishable hatred which afterwards grew in my heart against the oppression to which the unhappy people are subject and against their oppressors. That man, although in easy circumstances, dared not eat the bread he had earned by the sweat of his brow and could only evade ruin by displaying the same misery which prevailed all around him. I came out of his cottage equally touched and indignant, deploring the fate of those lovely lands on which nature has only lavished her gifts to make them the prey of barbarous tax farmers. Through personal experience, Rousseau acquired a respect and appreciation for the common people, rare among intellectuals of his day. This is one of the features that most struck and moved his readers. The famous German philosopher Immanuel Kant credited Rousseau with opening his eyes and awakening him to a sense of common humanity. Kant kept a picture of Rousseau on the wall of his study and regarded the Genevan writer as the Newton of the moral world. There was a time when I despised the common man who knows nothing. Rousseau set me right. This blind prejudice vanished. I learned to respect human nature. And I should consider myself far more useless than the ordinary working man if I did not believe this view could give worth to all others to establish the rights of man. In 1731, Rousseau visited Paris for the first time. His initial impressions were hardly favorable. It is safe to say that Rousseau's early disgust for Paris colored his feelings toward the group of thinkers associated with that city. Paris was the center of the Enlightenment, the great cultural movement of the age. The Enlightenment was not monolithic. It varied from one philosophe to another. The term philosophe means philosopher, but it is perhaps better translated as intellectual or man of letters. The philosophes included Voltaire, the most famous writer of his age, and Montesquieu, whose book Spirit of the Laws exerted a powerful influence on the framers of the Constitution of the United States. In general, the philosophes sought to popularize the new scientific approach to the world, to combat what they saw to be ignorance and superstition and the blind adherence to tradition. They were not revolutionaries, but reformers on a crusade to improve life through critical reasoning in the area of morals, religion, economics, and politics. Through the brilliance of their writings, they became the stars of the Parisian salons, those stylish gatherings presided over by cultivated ladies with an urge to be in the thick of intellectual and political affairs. An inquisitive young man, Rousseau familiarized himself with these new ideas. He also became acquainted with some of the most prominent philosophes. He journeyed to Paris to demonstrate a novel system of musical notation he had invented to make music more accessible to the people. There he met Denis Diderot, one of the leading philosophes. The cultural authorities rejected his system, but Diderot became his close friend, and then, in later years, his bitter enemy. In 1743, Rousseau became secretary to the French ambassador to the Republic of Venice. He was treated like a servant. Once, when the Duke of Modena came to dine, Rousseau was not permitted to sit at the table. He quit the job, but he had observed at close quarters how degrading dependence on another can be, and how it gives the one with the upper hand the opportunity to indulge the malice and the will to power that seemed common in so-called civilized man. Rousseau remembered this lesson. Back in Paris, he took up residence at an inexpensive hotel, where a young provincial woman, Thérèse Lavasseur, served as maid. People mocked her for her simplicity and countrified ways, but Rousseau's heart went out to her. She became his common-law wife, for the rest of his life. Their relationship has been criticized. Therese was indeed simple, in more ways than one. 
She could never remember the order of the months, and once, on being told that a certain acquaintance was a minister of the church, she got it into her head that he was the Pope, and always referred to him as such. Nonetheless, Rousseau felt comfortable with her, and loved her dearly. She gave him five children, which became the cause of great scandal, not because of their illegitimacy, but because Rousseau gave them up, one after the other, to the foundling asylum. When this became general knowledge, Voltaire let the secret out, there was a storm of criticism. How could Rousseau, the writer who spoke so movingly of the respect due the growing child and his blossoming spirit, how could he simply abandon his own children, and five of them to boot? A letter to a noble lady. Rousseau defends his chosen lifestyle. Why have I not married, you will ask? Madame, ask it of your unjust laws. It was not fitting for me to contract an eternal engagement, and it will never be proved to me that my duty binds me to it. But we ought not to have children when we cannot support them. Pardon me, madame. Nature means us to have offspring, since the earth produces sustenance enough for all. But it is the rich, it is your class, which robs mine of the bread of my children. I know that foundlings are not delicately nurtured. So much the better for them, they become more robust. They do not make gentlemen of them, but peasants or artisans. They would not know how to dance or ride on horseback, but they would have strong, unwearied legs. I deprived myself the delight of seeing them, and I have never tasted the sweetness of a father's embrace. Alas, I see in this only a claim on your pity. Here is a point Rousseau would reiterate. Personal misery is not the result of God, or nature, or of original sin. It is the result of the evil institutions of a corrupt society. Very soon, Rousseau would begin to expound this heartfelt feeling in works that have left their mark to the present day. In the summer of 1749, Rousseau underwent an experience which changed his life as well as the course of modern political thought. His friend Diderot had published a work which was considered anti-religious. Accordingly, an order for his arrest was issued by the director of publications of the French government. Diderot was thrown into prison a few miles east of Paris. One day, Rousseau, who could not afford a carriage ride, walked to visit his friend. In a copy of a newspaper he took with him, he saw the announcement of an essay contest proposed by the Academy of Dijon. The topic... Has the progress of the arts and sciences done more to corrupt or to purify morals? Upon reading this, Rousseau had a revelation which has been compared to the one St. Paul experienced on the road to Damascus. All at once I felt my mind dazzled by a thousand lights. A crowd of splendid ideas presented themselves to me with such force, in such confusion, that I was thrown into a state of indescribable bewilderment. Unable to breathe and walk at the same time, I sank down under one of the trees in the avenue and passed the next half hour in such a state of agitation that when I got up, I found that the front of my jacket was wet with tears, although I had no memory of shedding any. If ever I had been able to write down which I saw and felt as I sat under that tree, with what clarity would I have exposed the contradictions of our social system? With what simplicity would I have demonstrated that man is naturally good and has only become bad because of those institutions? After conferring with Diderot, Rousseau decided to submit an essay. This first major work, known as the Discourse on the Arts and Sciences, or the First Discourse, argued that progress in civilization had led to the decline of morals. Rousseau is 37 years old, his life more or less at loose ends. This essay made him famous. The first discourse made a kind of revolution in Paris, largely because it ran directly against the grain of progressive thinking among the philosophes. At the same time that Rousseau's essay appeared, the prospectus was being published for the Encyclopedia, the grand work edited by Diderot and the mathematician and philosopher Jean d'Alembert, which would set forth the knowledge of the age. Extending to some 28 volumes and appearing over two decades, this work was so important that the whole school of philosophes is sometimes referred to as the encyclopedists. 
besides Rousseau himself. Voltaire, Turgot, Quinet, and many other advanced writers contributed. The encyclopedia was shaped and animated by a doctrine derived from the English philosopher Francis Bacon. Through reason, manifested in the sciences and the practical and fine arts, man could improve his lot and progress toward a higher and better form of social life. Now, in first discourse, Rousseau challenged that faith in uncompromising terms. Every science, Rousseau maintained, was rooted in some vice. The arts were hopelessly tied up with luxury and fine living and generated corruption both in the individual and in the state. On this, Rousseau was open to criticism. He was a novice philosopher who asserted the corrupting influence of philosophy, a writer of books who despised book writing, a composer and musical theorist who declared the arts to be morally injurious. But it can be argued that, as always with Rousseau, you must go beyond the surface paradoxes and exaggerated rhetoric. Rousseau's point of view might win more adherence today if it was restated as follows. Moral goodness is infinitely more important and admirable than any intellectual or artistic accomplishment. Only a corrupt people can be blind to this fact. Moreover, cultural achievements cover up moral degradation. Nowadays, when the most elaborate education and the most cultivated taste have reduced the art of pleasing to a set of rules, every precept of politeness demands constant obedience. Good manners are dictated to us. We must always follow commands, never our own nature. Under this endless constraint, we no longer dare to appear as we are. In that flock of sheep we call society, each man in the same situation does exactly the same as others. This complaint came from the heart, and it found a response in the hearts of many readers. It has become part of the evidence that Rousseau was individualistic, a man who railed against social conventions which constricted individuality and suffocated spontaneity. It should be noted, however, that the social conventions Rousseau objects to are those produced by a corrupt society. Rousseau is still free to claim that in a virtuous society, the individual finds his true freedom affirmed by his perfect agreement with the customs of that society. In later years, Rousseau came to think poorly of the first discourse. Publicized by influential friends, however, it was an overnight sensation. For the most part, oddly enough, it did not sour Rousseau's relations with the encyclopedists. He continued to be friendly with Diderot and to contribute to the encyclopedia. But some wondered whether they were harboring an individual who was not quite the perfect philosophe he had seemed. Their suspicions grew and were aggravated by Rousseau's next major work. In 1754, the Academy of Dijon proposed another essay question. What is the origin of inequality among men? and whether it is authorized by natural laws. Rousseau's Discourse on the Origin and Foundations of Inequality Among Men, known as the Second Discourse, became even more celebrated and influential than the first. Both Edmund Burke and Napoleon looked on it as the fountainhead of the French Revolution. Published in 1755, the Second Discourse is a scathing attack on the institutions of organized society and on the type of human being they produce. Rousseau begins with man in the state of nature. This is a familiar concept, utilized by many preceding political philosophers. Rousseau's state of nature, however, differs in crucial respects. With the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes, the state of nature implies a war of all against all, waged by human beings who are innately aggressive and competitive. With another English philosopher, John Locke, a law of nature guides and rules over the state of nature, a law which individuals by and large obey even without government. Rousseau will have none of this. Both conceptions, he maintains, illegitimately import attitudes and desires into man's earliest state that could only have developed over long ages in close association with other men. The philosophers who have examined the foundations of society, Rousseau says, have felt the necessity to return to the state of nature, but none of them ever reached it. The true beginning of man, Rousseau maintains, was before language, before the family, virtually before thought itself. It is a condition of total isolation, hence total freedom. Having neither houses or huts, nor possessing property of any sort, everyone depended on chance for his lodging, 
and often slept only one night in any one place. Males and females united fortuitously according to encounters, opportunities and desires. They required no speech to interpret the things they had to say to each other, and they separated with the same ease. Man was content to live as the beasts did. He possessed only two natural capacities, the ability to feel pity and the ability for development. From the ability to feel pity comes man's moral feelings and his compassion. From the ability for development comes all the things, for good or evil, which distinguish civilized man from primitive or natural man. Man leaves this original state of nature and gradually comes to live in what Rousseau calls nascent society. Here he has a settled abode, a family life, and the simple beginnings of property. He associates with his fellows, but these are generally bonds of friendship and mutual aid. All in all, Rousseau believes this is man's happiest state. Tragically, it does not last. He who sang or danced the best... He who was the most handsome, the strongest, the most adroit or the most eloquent became the most esteemed. And that development marked the first step toward inequality and at the same time towards vice. From these first preferences were born, on the one hand, vanity and contempt, and on the other, shame and envy. The fermentation caused by these new leavens finally yielded compounds ruinous both to happiness and innocence. With this development comes a new emotion, which Rousseau calls self-love. This is different from the natural love that a creature has for itself, what we call the instinct of self-preservation. This emotion, channeled by pity or empathy, ultimately generates the feeling of humane concern for others. The next leap into social evolution, the introduction of agriculture, metalworking, and private property, increases man's ruthlessness. This is the true watershed, according to Rousseau. He describes its significance in the most famous passage in the Second Discourse. The first man who, having enclosed a piece of ground, could think of saying, This is mine, and found the people simple enough to believe him, was the real founder of civil society, how many crimes, wars, murders, miseries, and horrors would not have been spared to the human race by one who, plucking up the stakes or filling in the trench, should have called out to his fellow men, Beware of listening to this impostor. You are undone if you forget that the earth belongs to no one and that its fruits belong to all. Private property brings war into the world. It is not a part of natural man, as Hobbes claims. And with war, men feel the need for a sovereign, for an overarching authority capable of ending the violence and destructive anarchy. Thus, government is born. As Rousseau explains, it becomes a device for institutionalizing and eternalizing the rule of the rich over the poor. Later, in The Social Contract, he describes how a just and equitable government could come about. For now, he outlines how government until now was established. Admire human society as you will. The fact remains that it necessarily leads men to hate one another in proportion to the conflict between their interests. There is perhaps no rich man whose death is not secretly desired by his greedy heirs, often indeed by his own children. There is no ship at sea of which the sinking would not be good news for some merchant. Not a business house that a dishonorable debtor would not happily see burned down with all the papers in it. No community that does not relish the disasters of its neighbors. Rousseau is clearly not demanding a return to the earlier, more primitive stages of human development. Too much had changed. Nor is he hinting at any reform, certainly not the abolition of property. This discourse is a desperate, moralist, root-and-branch condemnation of the contemporary social order. Rousseau, the prophet who would show humanity the way out of the sink of corruption through politics, was yet to come. This second discourse did not win the prize, but it did set Europe talking of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. One reader who was not impressed was Voltaire, to whom Rousseau had sent a complimentary copy. Voltaire acknowledged it. Sir, I have received your new book against the human race, and I thank you for it. 
Never was such cleverness used in the design of making us all stupid. In reading your book, one longs to walk on all fours. But as I have lost that habit for more than 60 years, I feel unhappily the impossibility of resuming it. Privately, Voltaire was outraged, particularly by what he viewed as Rousseau's mindless attack on private property. He asked, has the man who has planted, sown, and enclosed a piece of land no right to the fruit of his labor? But Rousseau's sardonic assault on the legitimacy of property and his unmasking of government as a conspiracy by the rich was remembered by those who began the socialist tradition in France a few years later. Rousseau differed in temperament from the other philosophes, a difference of spirit and soul. This can be illustrated by an incident that occurred in the salon of Madame de Holbach, wife of the well-known philosophe Baron de Holbach. A country priest who had written a play pestered Diderot for his opinion of it. Highly annoyed, Diderot finally suggested that the clergyman read his play to the gathering. The Baron de Holbach, Rousseau, and other prominent intellectuals were present. As the poor priest read, the distinguished writers, except for Rousseau, vied with each other in expressing their sham delight and admiration for the trite and hackneyed work. Rousseau kept silent until, finally, he could no longer stand the mockery. The Baron de Holbach reported, Jean-Jacques rose from his chair like a madman, and springing towards the priest, seized his manuscript, threw it on the floor, and exclaimed to the horrified author, Your play is worthless! All these gentlemen are laughing at you. Go away from here. Go back to your parish duties in the country. The priest rose, no less furious, spat out all sorts of insults to his all-too-candid adviser, and from insults would have passed to blows and murder if we had not separated them. Jean-Jacques left in a rage which I believed to be passing, but which in fact has never ceased. Another major reason for the growing antagonism between Rousseau and the philosophes was religion. A number of the philosophes were atheists. Rousseau was deeply religious, if in a somewhat unorthodox way. To him, atheism seemed to rob human life, and especially human suffering, of all meaning. But embroiled in dispute with such clever and self-assured thinkers as the Parisian philosophes, Rousseau found himself troubled in his faith. Rousseau suspected that the philosophes, whom he was beginning to hate, were so corrupt that even their professions of atheism might be insincere. He describes the outcome of his spiritual crisis. I persevered. For the first time in my life I acted courageously. After what were perhaps the most ardent and sincere investigations ever conducted by any mortal, I made up my mind once and for all on all the questions that concerned me. It is true, no doubt, that the prejudices of childhood and the secret wishes of my heart tipped the scales on the side which was the most comforting to me. It is hard to prevent oneself from believing what one so keenly desires. I adopted in every case the opinion which seemed to me the most clearly proved and the most credible in itself, without worrying about objections which I could not resolve but which were met with equally powerful objections in the opposing system. Rousseau never forgave the philosophes for the torment they caused him on the question of God. And for their part, they grew exasperated with the overly sensitive Rousseau. After an altercation with him, Diderot complained, I throw myself into your arms like one who has had a bad fright. That man intrudes into my work. He fills me with trouble, and I am as if I had one of the damned souls at my side. May I never see him again. He would make me believe in devils and hell. The final break came over another issue dear to the hearts of both. Should artistic freedom prevail in a community, or should the requirements of morals and civic virtue take precedence? The philosophes called for artistic freedom, Rousseau for limits. In his essay, Letter to D'Alembert, Rousseau argues that the theater perverts truth by fostering illusion. It encourages luxury at the expense of simplicity and frugality. It sets up wit and sophistication as superior to ingenuous and natural values. Since it debases the character of the people, no argument for the pleasure it gives or the good taste it cultivates can carry any weight, for nothing is more important than the people's character. Once that is debased, 
the state decays and dies. In the letter to D'Alembert, Rousseau also passionately defends traditional sexual morality. Considering that he lived for decades in a common law marriage, this might strike some as hypocritical. But remember, although he attacked the theater, Rousseau was the author of several successful stage productions, so his hypocrisy, if that's what it was, ran rather deep. The next few years were the most productive of Rousseau's life. In quick succession, he wrote and published Julie, or The New Heloise, a novel dealing with the kind of romantic and sentimental themes for which he had harshly censured other playwrights and Emile, his influential and fictional treatise on education. Most importantly, Rousseau wrote and published his political masterpiece, The Social Contract. The Social Contract is subtitled Principles of Political Right. On the title page, Rousseau identifies himself as citizen of Geneva. And in the brief introduction, Rousseau somewhat smugly underscores the distinction he enjoyed over other philosophes. He was born the citizen of a free state and a member of its sovereign body. And whenever I reflect upon government, I am happy to find that my studies always give me fresh reasons for admiring that of my own country. The less than enthusiastic reception Geneva gave his most famous political work left Rousseau embarrassed and chagrined. Rousseau and social contract have been frequently misunderstood, even in the famous lines that open the first chapter. Man was born free, and he is everywhere in chains. Those who think themselves the masters of others are indeed greater slaves than they. How did this transformation come about? I do not know. How can it be made legitimate? That question I believe I can answer. Rousseau does not say that he condemns the fact that man is everywhere in chains, but rather that he intends to legitimize it. Human beings began in the state of nature described in first discourse in isolation. Now they exist in society dependent on each other and subject to law. Must man accept this change as a brute fact? Or can laws and social dependence be made reasonable and just? To answer these questions, Rousseau first considers alternative views on the genesis of legitimate authority. He rejects the notion that government evolves from the father's authority in the family. After all, children outgrow paternal authority. He also ridicules an idea spread by some apologists for absolute monarchy, namely that legitimate authority descends from the patriarchs of the Bible to the present rulers. Neither can strength be a basis for legitimate authority, since force cannot bind the will of the people. Only consent can. Thus we come to what Rousseau calls the social pact. This concept is key to understanding the social contract. A point is reached in the state of nature where the dangers and difficulties of life make self-preservation tenuous. In order to survive, men combine forces. But how to do that without becoming dependent on other men. How to find a form of association which will defend the person and goods of each member with the collective force of all, and under which each individual, while uniting himself with the others, obeys no one but himself and remains as free as before. The solution lies in the contract which constitutes civil society. Here is one of the most hotly contested passages in all of Rousseau. Here is the essence of this association in Rousseau's social contract. The total alienation by each associate of himself and all his rights to the whole community. Since the alienation is unconditional, the union is as perfect as it could be and no individual associate has any longer any rights to claim. If we eliminate from the social pact everything that is not essential to it, we find it comes down to this. Each one of us puts into the community his person and all his powers under the supreme direction of the general will. And as a body, we incorporate every member as an indivisible part of the whole. This act of association creates an artificial and collective body composed of as many members as there are voters in the assembly. And by this same act, that body acquires its unity, its common ego, its life, 
and its will. In its passive role, it is called the state. When it plays an active role, it is the sovereign. To many, the total alienation or surrender of rights to the community has seemed highly significant and alarming. This contrasts sharply with the classical liberal doctrines of John Locke. In his second treatise on civil government, Locke claims that the rights surrendered to the community are solely those which enable the community to better protect individual rights to life, liberty, and property. Government is an agency of defense for these specific retained rights. Locke's position became standard in British classical liberalism, and it underlies the American Declaration of Independence. In contrast, Rousseau maintains that through the social contract, members of society alienate all rights. Those who contend Rousseau is not a promoter of liberty in any commonly understood sense, but rather that he is the father of modern totalitarianism, point to this alienation of rights. Others, who side with Rousseau, point to his reasons for supposing the social contract will not be and cannot be oppressive. For one thing, the conditions of the contract are the same for all. Thus, no one can have an interest in making conditions onerous for others. Rousseau explains another safeguard of liberty within the social contract. Since each man gives himself to all, he gives himself to no one. And since there is no associate over whom he does not gain the same rights as others gain over him, each man recovers the equivalent of everything he loses and in the bargain he acquires more power to preserve what he has. Exactly what the individual preserves if he alienates everything is difficult to say. This is the end of side one. Please fast forward and begin side two.